Uh, Minister Tang, thanks again for, for joining us here at the Great Wave, the festival of the mm -hmm. House of Beautiful Business. So the House of Beautiful Business is a global think tank and community, and we are all about the idea of beautiful business. So um, my first question for you is, is there such a thing as beautiful government? And if so, how would you describe it? Yeah, certainly. Um, to me, a beautiful government is a government that radically trusts the people. The more the government trusts its people, the more beautiful it becomes. Because uh, just like smart city, it's about making the citizens wise. Um, a beautiful government is to trust the citizens so the citizens can create beauty. So on that on that notion of trust, and that's something that you you talk about very often. You say that's really critical trust among citizens, trust between citizens, and and the government. But in in many countries, in many democracies, trust has also often been lost or been destroyed. Right. So there is um, disenchantment with politics, uh, and there are, of course, like in any relationship, there are moments when when trust is broken. How do you restore trust once it's broken once? You know, isn't that harder than creating trust originally? So how do you do that mm -hmm. as, a, as a government? Sure. Uh, I think the easiest way uh, is just to owe up uh, to whatever we did wrong uh, and say uh, that the citizens really had a better idea. We were in the wrong. We are now implementing whatever the citizens have proposed, and we become kind of the vendor to realize the citizens' alternate vision. And this is what I call reverse procurement, uh, where the citizens set a new specification, and we deliver uh, the necessary resources to make it a reality. We have seen many, many times uh, of, of that during the counter coronavirus. You see that traditional rice cooker there. Uh, that was a uh, and a smaller one there. Uh, that was from a uh, professor Lai Chen Yu and who uh, had this uh, very crazy idea at the time, it seems, uh, that putting no water into a traditional rice cooker could disinfect uh, the medical mask without destroying the medical mask material. Uh, and because the medical masks were designed to be one-time use, uh, nobody really thought it's a, a sane uh, use of the, the technology, uh, rice cooker, I mean, isn't that for cooking rice? Uh, but then he published uh, and uh, the uh, TFDA, the Food and Drug Administration, well, initially become uh, kind of kind of skeptical uh, after the journalists asked them uh, for maybe the 100th time. Uh, they they tried that experiment themselves and found it to be really effective. Uh, and then we said that oh we're, we're wrong in doubting them. So we invited uh, Professor Lai Chen Yu to our daily live stream CECC Central Epidemic Command Center press conference, uh, where uh, Professor Lai explained the science uh, while the Minister Chen Shizhong started cooking uh, a medical mask. Uh, in the front of the TV. Uh, later on, international research would, would also show that this method also works uh, for N95 as well. So that's one, that's one example, right, of how gestures and, 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 and small practices generate trust. And trust was really pivotal also in the way you handled uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And Taiwan has been widely praised for the way it has uh, mm -hmm. responded. Um, so mm -hmm. what has your country done well and, mm -hmm. and what can other countries learn from the way you managed with the sure. uh, manage the crisis? Right in Taiwan, um, I mean, it's we're officially post-pandemic for months now, with no locally uh, transmitted cases. There's um, <clears throat> pop singers that hosts tens of thousands of audience, of course, all wearing masks uh, in the uh, Taipei Small Dome uh, in a live concert. Uh, we've been playing professional baseball for quite some time with a live audience, not robotic audience, uh, and, and many more, right? So for us, I think the key uh, is just to trust the citizens. We make sure that uh, we communicate the science early and in a humorous way so that people understand the theory, the R value and so on uh, behind the scientific measures. And then people would uh, come up with innovative ways uh, the traditional rice cooker for one, the mask availability map for the other, uh, from their own uh, innovations without a, any top-down gestures such as a lockdown. Uh, because we had a lockdown in 2003 when SARS 1.0 hits Taiwan, we locked down an entire hospital unannounced and indeterminate uh, when uh, it comes to the uh, SARS 1.1 
which is that right after the SARS, there was uh, many attempts in making vaccination, in making drugs and so on, which kind of fizzled, but uh, the constitutional court at the time, uh, right after SARS, charged the uh, legislature to devise a set of uh, regulations and laws that can counter SARS if 1.2, 1.3 comes again uh, with no lockdowns. So for us, lockdown was so traumatic that we will not go back there. And so we made the CECC, the toll-free number, the border quarantining, the digital fence, the idea that you wear a mask to protect you from your own unwashed hands, uh, cute folks, dogs. Uh, there's many, many parts uh, that could be uh, shared uh, in the Taiwan model uh, with um, different jurisdictions. And we've been sharing that, uh, I think, with 14 different countries a few days before the World Health Assembly. Uh, and we call it the Taiwan model. Mm. You, you, that's interesting that you mentioned that you have to communicate it in a, I, I believe you said in a humorous way that, that really engages mm -hmm. people. And yes. so obviously your response to the pandemic uh, is built on, on signs. I'm curious about how you orchestrate your communications. Is how mm -hmm. much of it is data based yeah. and scientific, mm -hmm. and how much of it is is intuition, right. or it's just a good feeling for what what your people um, respond to. It, well, it's it's science. I mean, social science is science, uh, and the science of um, communication is also communication science. These are all very scientific. Um, and so, for example, this is science. This is the spokesdoc uh, that I mentioned, uh, and we explain, for example, the science of covering your mouth and nose while sneezing, of physical distancing when you're indoor, keep three uh, Shiba Inus away from one another, when you're uh, outdoor, keep two, Rem remember to wear your mask because it protects you from your unwashed hands and so on. Uh, and, and all these are based on the very simple idea of humor over rumor. Uh, basically, uh, we measure the conspiracy theories uh, and the uh, people's um, kind of mis- and disinformation transmission rate. Uh, so, for example, maybe a conspiracy theory travel on our R value of three, meaning that uh, every hour, on average, one person spread to three people, and that will go viral, so to speak. Uh, but if we respond uh, in a quick fashion, an uh, hour or at most two, after such a conspiracy theory uh, spread with very cute dog pictures that has a R value of five, uh, then within a day or so, our message reach more people. And when you laughed about it, you could not feel outraged about the same thing anymore. And so it serves as a kind of mimetic vaccination uh, to make sure that people talk about these um, measures in a way that is not in a panicked, uh, anxious um, mode of outrage, but rather can laugh about it and then discuss the actual science behind it. And so it's all very scientific because we do measurements. Mm. Th th those are... Uh... I mean, the role of humor in, in communi communicating about the right practices regarding a pandemic is, is quite interesting. And also, I think what you said earlier, that governments have to admit when they make mistakes in mm -hmm. order to re recreate trust. Um, so let's maybe switch to uh, your philosophy of open of open government and talk more about that, because the pandemic mm -hmm. has been such a, a great example, I think, of what you envision there. That's right. Yeah, so in open government in Taiwan, um, we make the case of radical transparency. That is to say, in every conversation that we have, including this very interview, uh, we publish either as video or as transcript online, so people understand not only the what of policy, but also the how and why of policy making. And this is very important because uh, without the context of policy making, uh, no matter how innovative people are, people's contribution would not be able to be amplified into actual policies if we do not have the same uh, factual basis. And so publishing the context through which uh, people can understand how policies are made is essential. And so we have, for example, the joint platform, which has more than half of the Taiwanese population uh, visiting at least once, uh, and uh, is very popular as an e-petition platform. So with 5,000 signatures collected, uh, we can do pretty much anything uh, on the citizens order in order to give an account of why we're making policies this way. Uh, so it has been very successfully mobilized to, for example, to gradually ban the use of plastic straws, uh, even on national identity drinks such as the bubble tea, uh, or uh, to file the taxes, uh, but not uh, through a Windows computer, but uh, in a handheld uh, device or a Mac or Linux or even at the kiosk in the nearby convenience store. And that was started. 
uh, by the petitioner that gets fed up by the Windows uh, software. Uh, and then there, there's many more. And so if people uh, are not happy about how things are going, instead of waiting for four years to upload three bits, which is called voting, uh, they can get people's signatures very quickly and then get us uh, to come out and make an account and then work out the co-creation together. And what is required for such an open source uh, way of going about digital democracy, uh, specifically mm -hmm. culturally speaking? Why is it working so mm -hmm. well in, in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're a young democracy. So I think what's required is this uh, mentality uh, that democracy is itself a technology or rather a set of technologies that everybody can improve. It's not something that's fixed in stone. Um, well, back in the Greek times, uh, the, the Athens people actually did voting through this stone machine. So maybe at some point it was written in stone, uh, but now uh, we're in the digital age and people can up upload much more bits uh, than four bits per four years. Uh, and therefore democracy itself need to undergo the same digital transformation as other businesses so that we can not only digitize and optimize, but also include more people and incorporate more innovations in the democratic process. That is the attitude of democracy as a technology. And looking at the you know other other democracies and other societies in the world, mm -hmm. yes. uh, where do you see this next frontier of digital democracy go on a global scale? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we, we learned a lot from other democracies. Um, we learned, for example, the participatory budgeting system from um, Council and Decide in Madrid, uh, from the Paris city as well. We learned the e-petition system. We didn't create it on our own. We learned it from Better Reykjavik uh, from Iceland. Uh, the POTUS software that we use assistive intelligence uh, to gather people's uh, common grounds instead of polarized opinion that came from Seattle. Uh, I, the list goes on. So I, I don't think this is a Taiwanese thing. I'm more of a um, digital minister uh, and also kind of the ambassador from this civic technology community and internet governance community to the kind of real world politics uh, to make sure that whatever we invented, for example, in the Ethereum uh, cryptocurrency and the blockchain, uh, there's new ways of funding called quadratic funding, new ways of voting called quadratic voting uh, that are far more efficient but couldn't uh, be realized in pen and paper and paper tools uh, or stone tools that easily it requires um, you know uh, digital infrastructure and so I introduced quadratic voting to the presidential hackathon in Taiwan it's been going on for a couple of years now so it's all about translating what's already worked uh, in the internet open source community into everyday politics I think that is the direction to go and would be my main advice to other democracies now you've been called a, a genius minister tang and mm -hmm. and you really are a galleon figure of a very optimistic um way of of looking at digital democracy in fact you wrote an op-ed mm -hmm. for the new york times where you said the mm -hmm. future of democracy is digital democracy yes. now arguably you could say that we've been somewhat disappointed with digital right with big tech and and surveillance scandals and privacy mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. and on the other hand there's research saying that the worldwide support for democ de democratic systems is really in decline so i guess the question is what makes you so optimistic going forward mm -hmm. and is taiwan the exception mm -hmm. uh, or can it be the norm Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, like in 2013, if you go to a, a Taiwan anywhere in the street, ask a random people uh, whether you think a minister can hold open office hours every Wednesday uh, and where everything is on the record and whether you can start a petition or do a sandbox application, a participatory budget, the president herself herself hands out five trophies uh, every year for the social innovator to give, be given the presidential mandate, they will look at you like you're crazy. So there was a time, and it was not too long ago, it was just seven years ago, where a average person in Taiwan would feel that the democracy is going nowhere uh, and is kind of feeling uh, apathy, right? They're not feeling any passion uh, when it comes to political possibilities. And it took, of course, the Occupy movement in 2014, when we occupied the parliament with half a million people on the street and many more online uh, who talked about the cross-trade service and trade agreement and settled on a set of four demand, uh, not one less. Uh, that 
got accepted by the head of the parliament. So we have the reason to be optimistic because for us, the demonstration is not just a protest, it's a demo. Uh, it shows uh, everyone that it worked. Uh, and I think this is uh, gaining ground. For example, uh, the um, way of deliberative um, style uh, organization on the street uh, has been then improved and perfected, I would argue, by the people in Hong Kong in the anti-ELAP protest. Whereas in Sunflower, there's maybe 20 different centers. We couldn't call it decentralized. But in Hong Kong, there's maybe 2,000 centers, in which case uh, we have to call it decentralized because we cannot keep count of the centers anymore. Right? When it comes to organization, it's like purely horizontal or in their words, be water uh, style. Uh, and so I think um, around the world, people are finding new ways to horizontally um, organize themselves, whether they call it a democracy or whether they call it, um, you know, anti-establishment adhocracy. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it's fine by me, because for me, uh, any kind of organization that horizontally link people together to create new possibility is a good one. It's good if some government decide to be part of the multi stakeholder firm, like the Taiwanese government, but I firmly believe that this style of movement, uh, I have reason to be optimistic with or without governmental support. Mm. And in the horizontal organizations you talked about, the adhocracies, the question mm. I, I guess is always, to, to what degree does it still require a charismatic leader like you? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I know you're a very humble person, but at the same mm -hmm. time, you also mm -hmm. are the figurehead of this mm -hmm. kind of, of governing. So mm -hmm. how important is mm -hmm. it to, to rally around someone like mm -hmm. you who mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of media appearances mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and talks about these, uh, these mm -hmm. things? And also going forward, how important mm -hmm. will, will you be? Um, mm -hmm. Or is it is it now really up to the mm -hmm. community to, to self-organize? Yeah, I would say in Taiwan is is on autopilot now, uh, and uh, because I relinquished the copyright of my images, uh, so anyone can remix me to endorse whatever position that I have not even heard of. Uh, and so it's a remixing culture uh, that we're looking at, and in that sense. Uh, the way I, I bring the, the Hong Kong movement uh, up is that uh, there's easily thousands of charismatic leaders. The, the people who uh, compose May Glory Be to Hong Kong, the people who start this uh, kind of chorus in singing in a, a random supermarket, uh, and so on. Uh, each of those horizontal actions have its own charismatic leaders. Uh, but then it's thousands of them, so I can't keep track of them all. Uh, and so to me, this is what, uh, you know, police centered uh, or B water or adhocracy really means in that anyone who feels like uh, it's like a flash mob or something feels like starting something uh, can get the charisma from the horizontal network by starting a, a essentially a trending hashtag. Uh, and then a hashtag gains the life on its own. It becomes trending. And the first person who used the hashtag, uh, well, which would be Chris Messina, who invented the term hashtag. You, you don't ask for Chris uh, permission whenever we use a hashtag. He certainly did not patent it. So <laughs> there's no control. So the charisma is there, but there is no top-down control. There's no uh, exclusion uh, possible. Uh, nobody need to ask for my permission when they use my likeness in promoting their favorite idea. And nobody have to ask for Chris Messina's permission whenever they want to start a new hashtag. And that is the kind of style of leadership uh, that is essentially take all the sides. If if if, uh, um, if if you, you, Taiwan and this this way of governing is on autopilot, as you said, what remains there for you to do? So w when do you realize your mission is complete, and what are some of the next challenges for you going forward? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think my uh, work is already complete. It's been completed quite a quite a while ago, uh, and I think I'm mostly in this just for fun now, um, because I really enjoy listening to people. I really enjoy uh, taking various different positions and ethnographically, well, I just hang out uh, with people and learning new languages, new cultures, and so on. Uh, so I'm I'm um, honored and grateful that people are paying their taxes to support me in my hobby. 
be full time, I guess. Uh, but I, I don't think this is a emission quote unquote anymore. Certainly not uh, the kind of the feeling that we had in 2014. Like if we don't help the occupiers, uh, the entire democracy might in, be in shambles. Uh, I think especially after COVID, um, well, we say after, but we're actually during. Uh, so after the worst of COVID uh, in Taiwan, uh, I think we're firmly uh, having a polity where people genuinely care about one another, no matter how different in terms of, um, you know, culture or age or political belief or whatever. Uh, and with this kind of polity, I think uh, I'm really just doing this for fun now. Speaking of fun. Speaking of fun and the horizontal movement that you talked about, um, of course, some of the um, technological innovations of these recent years have helped with that a lot. So we'd be curious to to hear your opinion on a platform like TikTok, for example, um, mm -hmm. on a scale from one to ten. How excited mm -hmm. are you about such a mm -hmm. platform and what mm -hmm. technology stands for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, like 15 seconds of fun, isn't it? Uh, so, um, I think um, TikTok and the like is built on the idea of um, essentially the phone being a uh, extension of our just like sensory organs, I guess. Uh, it's basically a glimpse of connectedness, uh, which is actually asynchronous because it's not really at the same time, not as our current video conference uh, conversation where I can see you nodding and not in return. So we know that we're in the same space. Uh, it's essentially in asynchronous mode. And because it's so short, um, the psychological projection of the person holding uh, the phone, uh, looking at it, have to complete the gestalt, uh, that is to say, to fill in what's missing. Uh, and that creates a both a yearning, as in longingness of uh, more, and also a connectedness, but that is largely a, uh, like mirror, as in black mirror, a, a personal reflection of one's own interpretation and not uh, what's actually on the other side. Uh, and so for me, I, I always use my iPad with this um, Apple Pencil, and I always use my phone, which is a Samsung Galaxy, with this stylus uh, to remind myself uh, that the touch screen uh, is not my skin and uh, that this is not an extension of my body uh, because I always interact it, uh, with it through an intermediary. It could be pencil or stylus uh, or a, um, I don't know, keyboard, mouse or whatever. Um, I don't get addicted and my psychological projections is reserved for people that I'm sure that is sharing the co-presence uh, with me, which is like the, the two of you now, uh, but not uh, through a psychological projection to the fragments of like just uh, 15 minutes, uh, sorry, 15 seconds, a glimpse of other people. So I don't get addicted. I don't have the feeling of FOMO. Uh, and I consider these actually to be counterproductive if what we want to build uh, is long-term trusting relationships uh, between people. But of course, these are still great ways to discover new people. The point is uh, simply if you don't don't spend quality synchronous time with them, uh, then these are um, not a good substitute uh, for what a satisfying long-term relationship could be. And how might these then be redesigned, like uh, based on what kind of principles uh, to make the mm -hmm, sense mm -hmm. of longing and connection more mm -hmm. hopeful and, and real? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just sharing the space uh, and sharing the same time. Uh, there's ways uh, to share the same space even amidst the COVID. Uh, for example, I just got this XR Space headset uh, and I'm really excited about it because uh, it's the first headset that I can wear in VR for like hours and hours, like three or four hours uh, without feeling that it's too heavy. It doesn't need a controller so I can use my hands and navigate uh, very uh, freely and it can scan my surroundings so I can easily bring uh, other people into a space that I am in. Uh, and with this, this is not virtual reality, this is shared reality. Uh, it brings people together and feel uh, because it has a built-in 5G uh, chip uh, when I nod and the other person sees my nodding almost as quickly as if uh, we're in the same room or if we're connected through fiber optic lines as we are now uh, through fiber optics and ethernet. Uh, and so, yeah, things like a shared reality device for me is much more preferred than a solo virtual reality experience where everybody may be in their own reality, but there's nothing to connect them together. 
So speaking of virtual reality, um, the analyst Benedict Evans has coined this term VR winter, saying that, interestingly enough, the pandemic did not lead to a rise in or hasn't led to a rise in VR applications, right? It wasn't really a VR's hour. Uh, although Burning Man is now going fully virtual, um, this might maybe be a sort of breakthrough moment for VR, but it's not. It's, it's been really hard to enter mainstream. So what, what's your outlook on VR? How long is mm -hmm. it going to take and does mm -hmm. it have a future really as a mainstream mm -hmm. technology? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, uh, the previous headset that I tried were too heavy and requires the use of a controller. Uh, and so unless you're a dedicated professional gamer, uh, these two are deal breakers. I, I mean, maybe you would give it five minutes of your time, but nothing more because it's just not very comfortable. Uh, and so it's just, um, I think a, a convenience uh, and comfort uh, is really important for people to feel that they can express them feel freely uh, in any space. I mean, if I, um, you know, go to a physical space and but they ask me to don this very heavy dongle and uh, I cannot, uh, you know, gesture, I can just uh, press some uh, Nintendo controller keys, uh, which controls my virtual hand, uh, I, I would not feel that I'm actually in that space, I would feel that I'm in a kind of simulation and that will inhibit uh, my creativity creative and social potentials. And so I'm not saying that XR space is the breakthrough device, but any breakthrough device need to solve for, uh, you know, controller free and for the lightweight enough that those two convenience factor. And what about uh, Neuralink? So we just heard mm -hmm. of uh, Elon mm -hmm. Musk's uh, latest. Yes. So that mm -hmm. goes obviously further for this human machine interaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Is that exciting to you and in what way and where do you see that going? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I think Neuralink uh, currently uh, can uh, transmit several bits uh, of information, uh, like uh, maybe enough to move a mouse pointer uh, or things like that. Uh, but what I'm talking about uh, in the shared reality uh, requires like gigabits per second, um, which is not even um, one tenth of the bandwidth of what Neo uh, had in the Matrix original movie uh, with this um, USB line, well, not really USB, uh, with this connection, uh, the spinal cord connection. Uh, I think that's 10 gigabits per second uh, or so if you want to capture all the sensory uh, stimuli. So, um, of course, Neuralink is a beginning, uh, but the uh, bits are not currently, um, you know, broad enough in as in broadband uh, to uh, make the uh, pigs believe that they are in another reality. Uh, and so it, it, of course, may be useful for people who are paralyzed and, and so on, but for it to really become uh, like sub vocalization or a communication machine or telepathy machine or things like that, uh, the technology still needs a lot of work. I, the, the same might apply to uh, GPT-3, which was mm -hmm. called by MIT, the MIT Technology Review, called the most powerful language model mm -hmm. ever. It's been this mm -hmm. overnight sensation uh, developed mm -hmm. by the OpenAI mm -hmm. Alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What's your take on GPT-3? How significant is it in, mm -hmm. in the uh, evolution of AI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I've, I've played hours and hours uh, with GPT-2, uh, with Talk to Transformer, uh, and I plan to use GPT-3 to make a art installation that can synthesize uh, my speech and response, uh, and so that people can have a kind of 24-hour-a-day uh, conversation uh, with um, my poetry, basically, because one of the things that GPT-3 does very well is that you can tell it, uh, you know, take the Lord of the Rings, but uh, express it in a style of Dr. Seuss, uh, and, and it does that brilliantly. Uh, and so it's not original in either content or style, uh, but it can mingle uh, the contents and the styles uh, in very surprising uh, configurations that were uh, very difficult for human beings uh, to uh, work with so much uh, configurations uh, in the same time. And so I think it's a great canvas uh, on which uh, our creative um, mind can set ourselves free. It's just like uh, when I work on translation projects, uh, I prefer translating uh, 
uh, like difficult, uh, like Jabberwocky or uh, even all the way to Finnegan's Wake, uh, and there is no uh, one right translation. Uh, and now with GPT-3, we can explore uh, much more widely into the possibility space uh, of culture and of language, and therefore create or recreate as translators uh, the kind of feelings uh, that Joyce uh, would want it uh, to express in that contemporary state uh, into our contemporary state. Uh, and that's something without GPT-3's help, um, one person can easily spend decades uh, in just translating one chapter uh, of uh, Finnegan's Wake into modern language, um, like a non-English, uh, well, non-Finnegan's Wake language. Uh, and so I think yeah, it's, it's a great uh, boon uh, to the people who uh, are doing creative work around words. Well, one more follow-up question on GPT-3. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's still prone to spewing out hateful, sexist, and racist languages mm -hmm. to many mm -hmm. other um, uh, mm -hmm. language models uh, tra just trained like on AI. Just like humans, <laughs> yes. And it's also sometimes very off, as other mm -hmm. commentators have observed, mm -hmm. with very mm -hmm. trivial things. So mm -hmm. how long will it, will it take until we can really fully trust it? And then, mm -hmm. again, maybe the philosophical question is, mm -hmm. do we have to fully trust it? Yeah, trust it for what? All I said was it's that it's a a glorifies uh, synonyms dictionary, right? Uh, and of course, it's synonyms not on the words level, but on the paragraph and stanza, and uh, it doesn't do rhyming that well, but uh, on the paragraphs level, on the essay level. Uh, and so, yeah, um, I mean, you don't trust the Oxford dictionary uh, in the traditional sense of trust, right? Uh, you would say that you consider its information to be informative or that if it gives you some example sentences, you would say that it reflects uh, the word's usage. But you would not just take some example sentences from the LED and then call it your essay. That would be uh, very interesting but wrong. Uh, and so uh, I, th I don't think it's the, uh, when we use the term trust, uh, we mean trusting as in trusting other people here. We merely mean that uh, it can um, explain uh, a full account of where did they get that idea. And that may be the lowest um, kind of requirement that one can expect of AIs nowadays, which is uh, to be accountable, to give a account and explanation of where its attention were and how, what were the source materials uh, that it looked at uh, to produce uh, such a answer. But how to make use of those, those answers, I don't think that we should treat it as an oracle where we just blindly assume that it's right, because all, all, when it's all said and done, uh, GPT-3 is a tool that predicts what's a likely next word, uh, given a very large corpus, and that's what it does. And I trust it to do that, but not anything else. Another very exciting technology that everyone is uh, talking about is quantum computing, of course. Mm. How do you stand on that and like give us your, um, yeah, your, your opinion on where it is currently mm -hmm. and where it might um, mm -hmm, be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, in terms of uh, cryptography uh, and ensuring a secure link, um, quantum computing is exciting because it carries the potential of breaking the existing crypto mechanisms, but also it carries the potential of establish a, a really uh, like nothing since the invention of the one-time pad, a truly secure link uh, between people free from eavesdroppers, uh, at least eavesdropper that cannot uh, you know go and modify the laws of physics. Uh, which is very difficult, by the way. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, it provides us with uh, novel materials uh, to work with in terms of communication and in terms of computing. Uh, I think it's a very worthwhile um, area of study, and especially cryptographers uh, need now to work on post-quantum to first guard uh, our existing digital infrastructure to make sure that the transition to from uh, traditional crypto uh, to post-quantum crypto is as painless, as smooth as possible without too much disruption, um, and certainly, hopefully, taking um, not as long as the IPv4 to IPv IPv6 transition. Uh, and then uh, we also need to make sure uh, that whatever new uh, quantum encryption apparatus that we make uh, still remains affordable, as is uh, the pretty good uh, privacy tools that made initially the public key infrastructure affordable. Otherwise, we will create a huge 
power imbalance uh, where people who have quantum computers can effectively eavesdrop on the rest of the world's communication and their communication um, devices are too expensive to be enjoyed by the citizenry and that would be very undemocratic. Mm -hmm. So you touched upon it already. Um, some of the technologies we talked about raise uh, serious privacy issues. Mm -hmm. And um, Shoshana Zuboff uh, wrote mm -hmm. this book about the surveillance capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic has, of course, perhaps uh, enhanced support for, for contact tracing apps and for mm -hmm. transparency as a virtue per se. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm curious about your, your concept of privacy and where you would draw the line between what you earlier called radical transparency and mm -hmm. the right to obscurity, even mm -hmm. in public or especially in public, the right mm -hmm. to be forgotten, the right not to be recognized. Mm -hmm. um, so where mm -hmm. do you draw the line? What's your concept of mm -hmm. privacy? Sure. Uh, radical transparency means transparency at a root. The state makes the state's inner workings transparent to the citizens, but we're not making the citizen transparent to the state. Uh, although that could also possibly be called transparency, that's not what we mean. Uh, what we mean is to make how the public sector functions uh, demystify it, uh, making sure that there is no um, inner workings of the state uh, that escapes the uh, audits from the people. But it doesn't mean that individual public servants are free from privacy. Uh, although I make a transcript of all the meetings that I chair, each participant is given 10 working days to co-edit the transcript to maybe pseudonymize themselves if they wish to do so. If they bring up an anecdote about a friend who have not cleared that anecdote for publication, they can edit it away to convey the same meaning uh, without mentioning any particular friend. If we make in-jokes, we uh, translate it into some out jokes during those 10 days of uh, uh, co-editing. But the point is that uh, it serves a public good and it takes effort, takes time to essentially um, go back and uh, make sure that parts of the uh, speeches are less transparent uh, than full transparency, but it takes effort. So radical means at the root, it means by default. By default, everything is transparent, but if people go back and edit, that takes time. This is as opposed to uh, closed door meetings, uh, off the record meetings where nothing is kept in record, but occasionally people may, you know, quote other people to other journalists, uh, and then uh, the journalist will uh, fill in psychological projections because there's a lack of context. And then uh, I would argue it's actually worse for democracy. It's better for democracy if people can uh, all agree on a version of record that doesn't invade anyone's privacy and is felt comfortable to all participants. And after 10 working days, we release that version and all the journalists can then contribute by adding their perspectives, which is the really uh, valuable part, the analytical uh, power of the investigative journalist, rather than uh, comparing like who gets the scoop uh, from whom. Uh, and I think that is the case for radical transparency. It uh, reinforces privacy. Uh, it does not encroach on privacy. And on privacy and, and surveillance on a governmental level, uh, and of course, we, if we talk about Taiwan, um, we have to talk about its relationship to China as well. Um, and you called, I read in an article, um, China's province Xinjiang, uh, a quote, mm -hmm. prototype model uh, of a fully totalitarian uh, mm -hmm. surveillance state. Uh, mm -hmm. end quote. Mm -hmm. So how do you see other mm -hmm. regions um, in and around China, maybe most recently mm -hmm. Hong Kong, uh, moving in a similar mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I said that compared to Xinjiang, previous attempts of totalitarianism uh, is at best subtotal. <laughs> Uh, they're not totally total uh, because uh, there were uh, no digital apparatus, especially computer vision uh, that could track uh, at so many people uh, 24 hours a day. But now with computer vision, they, they could and they did deploy uh, things that way. And so um, I think it serves as a constant reminder that when we say transparency, uh, there is a value behind transparency. If you say it with a democratic value, you point the camera to the state 
and you make the state transparent. But if you say it from a totalitarian mindset, you turn that around uh, and then point the camera at the people, and then you make the people transparent to the state and the state completely uh, obscure. Uh, and so I think that the power of the camera holder uh, is very, very important. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Thomas Mann uh, coined the word surveillance uh, to mean that the citizens should hold the camera, not the state uh, to hold the camera. And I think that is a, a very important lesson that we're learning uh, around the PRC regime. Uh, and it serves as a constant reminder for us to not go uh, where they're going. So you uh, go ahead. Sorry, Monica. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. You go. <laughs> I wanted to come now to um, to your role as a as a leader. So a bit more personal um, questions that I'm just very curious about. Um, so I uh, I grew up uh, in a Chinese household, but in Germany, so I'm Chinese German. Uh, and in my home, we never really touched on super intimate conversations about like who you are and how you relate to um, others, so identity, intimacy, sexuality, um, and love, really. And um, I'm curious, you, you know, as as a leader on the global stage, uh, being an outspoken um, transgender um, and also stating that you're sort of post uh, gender, so not mm -hmm. non binary, yeah, like but post non binary, yeah. yeah, just just whatever my pronouns are, whatever exactly. Yes. Like uh -huh. you don't really care, <laughs> so uh -huh. you go one step further. Uh -huh. um, how do you see your role and responsibility um, as a leader for future generations uh, in mm -hmm. that regard, especially for Taiwanese people, mm -hmm. but also you know the Asian diaspora around the world? Yeah, I think this is a simple attitude that if the environment is um, not friendly or is even hostile uh, vis a vis who you are, then it's not your fault. It's the environment that needs to change. Uh, when I was a child, when I was seven years old, uh, I start writing and I write with my left hand because I'm left handed. Uh, my dad also and his mother, my grandma also. Uh, but uh, in my parents and grandparents days, uh, they were taught to uh, kind of forcibly learn how to write with their right hand, um, mostly because I think um, all the where the uh, pen and uh, calligraphy, uh, writing and whatever, uh, the writing uh, directions, uh, because it uh, was right to left vertically at that time. Uh, and then there's also uh, like the telephone booth uh, It's definitely everything is on the right hand side. Uh, and like the, the entire environment is designed with right handed in mind and it's just normal and the left handed people are taught to to cope basically uh, and uh, when I started learning to write uh, my grandma also told me uh, that the environment will be hostile to me uh, and that I have to eventually learn to uh, use my right hand but not even uh, a year after that I encounter personal computers uh, in which case uh, the mouse doesn't care. The mouse, if you put it on the left hand side, you just whip, swap its left and right buttons, right? So it doesn't care uh, whether I'm left handed or right handed. And when I type on the keyboard, of course, I have to use both hands. Uh, and so suddenly, and nowadays when I pick them on my phone, it doesn't care whether I pick up from my left hand or right hand either. Uh, and so because of the environment that changed, uh, I uh, make sure that nowadays um, I don't think and define myself as either a left-handed person or right-handed person. I'm in fact uh, ambidextrous uh, by now, uh, and it actually uh, makes me more more free. I would argue, especially in virtual reality. Uh, but uh, we say controllers. Uh, but uh, the the point I'm making is that um, if people see. Uh, arbitrary binary distinctions uh, in Taiwanese politics, it used to be uh, oh. pan blue or pan green, right? Uh, and uh, if you see, um, for example, when I filed the HR form, uh, when I become a digital minister, uh, my party affiliation is right next uh, to my, my gender. And uh, so I just uh, wrote uh, none, uh, not applicable uh, on, on both of those. Uh, um, um, squares uh, and and it's uh, a really 
uh, interesting and I would say also empowering uh, gesture for many people who see themselves not captured by the pan blue or pan green political division, not captured by the um, you know girl like or boy like uh, gender stereotypes, uh, being able to simply say um, whatever. Uh, I think is a powerful um, gesture, uh, and more and more people in Taiwan are now indeed doing that. And how does this, uh, like, whatever, uh, like, in not checking any boxes, basically, uh, mm -hmm. attitude and, and viewing of the world really mm -hmm. uh, influenced your leadership? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, rather I can check all the boxes, right? It's the same thing. Uh, and then, uh, because in my mind, I don't see half of the population being different from uh, from who I am. Uh, and so it enables me to be more uh, empathetic. Uh, if people talk about their puberty, I have gone through two puberties. So there's bound to be something similar in my life experience, in your life experience. Uh, when people talk about uh, handwriting, I've written with my left and my right hand, right? So there's bound to be something similar uh, between me and you. And if you have some life uh, experience that I cannot empathize with, I make a point of uh, just um, exercising uh, my mind and, and maybe um, and embark on a journey of a week or two of just mingling uh, with uh, your culture until that I can see the world from your culture's perspective. And this is called transculturalism, I think is a very important context. Uh, and the context of transculturalism, I think goes all the way back uh, in early 20th century when Dr. Sanya Sen, uh, who initially started this revolution uh, of uh, fighting off the Manchurians and restoring the uh, ethnic Han uh, rule, uh, but then uh, he embarked on this idea of uh, Zhonghua, which is uh, literally um, between flowers, uh, so that uh, he Bought, brought this idea of transculturalism uh, into the founding of the New Republic so that the Manchurians is just one more culture that can interpret uh, this Republic of Citizens and that we can learn from, which is a very radical approach uh, back in that historical context. And we're now applying the same transcultural um, attitude uh, to the indigenous Taiwanese people, to the new immigrants, and even non-human beings, uh, because we all share this uh, ecological reality together. So uh, I read somewhere that as a child also you were bullied, and mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious whether uh, there was a specific moment in which you realized that you would rise above the bullying, you would be able to articulate your own truth, and, mm -hmm. and have such an impact really at the world mm -hmm. stage. Um, mm -hmm. what, was there a specific moment or what, what was sort of the, the, the you know, the, the catalytic event that, mm -hmm. that allowed you to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, a particularly liberating moment came when I was 15 years old. Uh, and uh, I talked to the principal of my high school saying that I've already been making like open source, although there's no such word back then, free software contributions uh, with open access well, that word haven't arrived at that time either, right? Uh, with this uh, like uh, archive, ARXIV, uh, open um, academies a community uh, and where people post their preprint papers and I write random emails and people write back and before long we're doing research together and so I show the principal uh, the printouts saying that um, I don't see the reason of uh, attending a senior high or a university anymore because I'm now doing research and uh, the principal used to tell me that I have to spend like 10 years getting very good grades going into a uh, prestigious university working for my favorite professor as a postdoc before I can actually do research. But now I'm actually already doing research as a 15 years old. Uh, and then the principal, after uh, looking at the printouts, uh, thought for a minute and then said, OK, tomorrow you don't have to go to school anymore and I will cover for you. Uh, and then she did cover for me, essentially fake the records of my attendance. And that <laughs> enabled me uh, to then uh, just uh, study randomly at universities, uh, especially around philosophy, and then also co found uh, some uh, startup enterprises uh, before I turned 16. Speaking of bullying, uh, are, are we at risk of bullying AI? Are we at risk of mm -hmm. discriminating against AI? Because mm -hmm. isn't AI the ultimate other? Should we mm -hmm. generate or nurture a different relationship to mm -hmm. AI and consider mm -hmm. it more of a living thing? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when an AI has their own life history, when they are able to suffer, uh, as described by Ted Jiang in the novel uh, novelette uh, collection Exhalation, I think that particular one is called uh, The Life Cycle of Software Pro Objects. Uh, it's a novella. Uh, it talks about something that you talked about, about bullying AIs. Uh, but truth to be told, uh, I think our AI at this moment, even with GPT-3, is maybe on the kind of simulating nematodes um, <laughs> stage. Uh, uh, and not at all at a stage uh, where we can uh, meaningfully say that they are suffering. Uh, and so, yeah, we will deal with that problem before that problem presents itself by having conversations around, uh, for example, Ted Jiang's novella. Uh, and I think uh, that will uh, brace people for the impact when one day, maybe with quantum computing, maybe with full brain simulation, uh, that we do have uh, AIs that can feel pain and suffering. Although um, most futurists say that it would not happen in the next five or 10 years. So that gives us plenty of time to prepare. Let's talk about, uh, in the remaining time that we have, let's talk about language. Mm -hmm. Because you touched upon literature and the importance of, of literature. Thomas Mann, Finnegan's Wake, James Joyce, uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned already others. Um, I guess my question is, uh, what's, your, what's your favorite word? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, my favorite word, uh, by the way, I, I talked about uh, Steve Mann, I think, uh, the, the person who coined the term uh, surveillance. So um, if I said Thomas Mann, that was a uh, Freudian slip. Uh, anyway, so uh, anyway, so uh, my, my favorite word, that's a really good one. Um, I think, yeah, it, it, it's got to be the um, both Arabic numeral and a kanji. Uh, and it's uh, literally zero. You write with, with a circle. And on the on, on language uh, and also more, because you mentioned you, you write your own poetry. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I've read also that you live by the Taoist uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some core principles uh, for you personally that you uh, take to, to lead your own life and, and work based on that philosophy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, um, yeah, maybe you read that uh, Wired interview <laughs> where I quoted randomly the, the Dao De Jing. Uh, and, and I think this is, uh, yeah, really nice uh, stanza uh, that the Wired interview quoted uh, the, about the use of not, right? Hollowed out clay makes a pot where the pot's not is where it's useful. So the profit in what is is in the use what isn't. Uh, although uh, when you talk about my personal philosophy, because that's more like a work philosophy. Uh, so my personal philosophy is maybe one chapter before. Uh, that's chapter 10 of the Tao Te Ching. And it goes like this. Um, can you keep your soul in its body? Hold fast to the one. And so learn to be whole. Can you center your energy, be soft, tender, and so learn to be a baby? Can you keep the deep water still and clear, so it reflects without blurring? Can you love people and run things and do so by not doing? Opening, closing the gate of heaven. Can you be like a bird with her nestlings, piercing bright through the cosmos? Can you know by not knowing to give birth to nourish, to bear and not to own, to act and not lay claim, to lead and not to rule. This is mysterious power. It's beautiful, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Minister Tang, before we let you go, um, one last question for you. Um, speaking of language, we, we called our festival in December last year, strangely enough, the Great Wave. Naively so, we had no idea what was going to unfold. But since then, the great wave, and it had a lot of connotations before, it has even more meaning for us now. What does the great wave, that term, the great wave, what does it mean for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it summons to me the, the idea of the, the eternal, right? A, a great wave, the ocean, uh, is as close as inter internal beings as uh, there is on the planet Earth. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I'm reminded of, again, the Tao Te Ching, uh, like uh, the increase of life um, 
is full of portent. The strong heart exhausts its vital breath. The full grown is on the edge of aging. And these are not the way. Uh, to know harmony is to know what's eternal. And to know what's eternal uh, is enlightenment. And that is what this uh, picture of great waves uh, summons uh, in my mind. Minister Tang, thank you very, very much for um, uh, this time with us and for all this, uh, for these inspirational insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the great conversation and the great questions.